This is the veteran spotlight interview of Benno Cleveland, who served in the United States Army from 1968 to 1970, is a Vietnam War veteran. We're in Fairbanks, Alaska, and I'm Andrea Gusty conducting the interview on behalf of U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski in conjunction with the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Benno, thank you so much for making time for us today. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start from the beginning. Tell me where and when you were born. Well, I was born back in uh, April 25th, 1950 here in Fairbanks, and uh, I was born to Howard Pundajack Cleveland and uh, Lydia Elizabeth, well, her last name before she, she died is Bolt, but uh, he met her over in Germany during World War II, after the war, and he got married with her, and they, he brought her over here, and here I am. So. And uh, like I said, I was born here in Fairbanks. So, what else do I need to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any brothers and sisters? How big is your family? Uh, I have uh, nine brothers that are passed away, and then I have two sisters and two brothers living. Uh, one lives over in Germany. He likes it over there more than he does here. And then the other three, they uh, live here in Fairbanks. So, the majority of us, we still recite here in Fairbanks. Well, tell me, um, you grew up here in Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. At what point did you decide or did you join the U.S. Army? Well, well my mom and my dad got a divorce back in 1957, and uh, we flew to Europe. We flew to Germany and lived with my German grandparents for four years. And uh, going back and forth, I got behind in schoolwork. So I was behind in school whenever I got back to Alaska in 1961. And back in uh, 1968, uh, I wasn't doing too well in, uh, in life of high school. Uh, I just don't know, I, the interest wasn't there. But uh, we were out, I was kind of a, I don't know, always getting into trouble here and there, nothing too serious. And uh, I always used to have a good relationship with the city police. They knew me pretty well. And uh, they told me one day that I would belong to them. And I laughed at them. And I told them, I said, no. Nah. I said, you know, when I turn 18 years of age, you have to forgive and forget. You can't use my juvenile record against me. So I says, I think not. And I guess they knew me better than I knew myself because uh, 1968, after I turned 18, uh, I got in some trouble here in, in Fairbanks, and I got into a fight with a, a young man I thought was about 21, 22, and uh, ended up hurting him pretty bad, and it turned out he was only 16. And as we were talking a little earlier and laughing, uh, you said I enlisted. I, I did enlist, but uh, as what we call a great society choice. Back in the 60s, uh, they gave you a choice that if you got into trouble with the law, you had a choice to either join the military or you'd go to jail. And uh, I think a lot of us, we thought that, well, you know, at least I did. I wasn't afraid of fighting. And uh, I ended up joining the military and, of course, went through the training when I got to Vietnam. It was a lot different kind of fighting than I thought. So that's how I ended up joining the military and joining the Army. It was. Uh, you know, it was a, a mistake that I made when I was younger. I had to pay for it, and looking back and between now and then, it was an, I, I still have no regrets uh, about joining the military, although I've had a lot of trouble after I've gotten out uh, with PTSD and uh, medical problems. You said that when you got there, it was different fighting than you expected. What do you mean? Oh, they were playing for keeps. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't like the old street street fights and gang fights over here, you know, where you kick the hell out of each other and then later on you, you go back home and you heal and everything else over there. They were, they were playing for real. There was no, no games over there. There was a lot, of, a lot of terrible things over there. I, I understand if you don't want to talk about it, but is, can you tell me some of your memories from over there? Some of the things that stick out in your mind? It was, well, you know, I've done a lot of healing. When I first, when I got a medical discharge back in 1970, uh, I went through a lot of hell and misery. But when we went to
went to Vietnam. We went to Vietnam as individuals, the majority of us. And then when we, uh, our tours were finished and we came back home, we came back home as individuals, not like you see nowadays, where a lot of the soldiers nowadays, they go over as a unit. So when we went to Vietnam, it was pretty lonely. You know, you didn't know anybody when you got there. You didn't know anybody when you were flying over there. And of course, uh, when you came back home, you didn't know anybody. So, you know, and when you got there, the majority of the guys that had been there for quite a while, they uh, tried to stay away from you because you were considered new blood. You didn't know anything, and you could probably get yourself killed or hurt or even get them killed or hurt, and that's why a lot of people didn't want to be around you when you first got there. And uh, it was just a lonely, lonely time for a while. And then to see what really, is, is seeing, seeing combat is, is completely different for uh, a Western uh, teenage kid because 18 years old they consider you to be an adult but you're still a teenager and the majority a lot of a lot of guys over there were anywhere from 18 in their early 20s and irregardless what kind of training we received and everything else come getting into combat uh, you can't prepare anybody for actual combat seeing people getting killed and people getting maimed, people getting hurt, and uh, it just affects you, it stays with you the rest of your life. And uh, that's some of the things I remember from over there is, uh, I remember the first time I ever got shot at, didn't know I was getting shot at. We were walking down a, a trail, I was, I was stationed down in, in, in the Macon Delta. I was with an organization, uh, it was 4th to 47th, 9th Infantry, and they were, it was with the Mobile Marine River Forces, and uh, we were stationed on ships, and there were usually two infantry companies per ship, and what we would do is we, we would go out on uh, patrol boats and they would kick us off. We'd be out for three days and three nights going out on missions, and then they would rendezvous with us on the fourth day and then they would go ahead and bring us bring us back into uh, our mother ships to let us dry out because down in the Mekong Delta in the, in the swampy area and everything it was always wet and we were all continuously wet and soaked but uh, the first time I ever was out on my first mission we were walking down a trail and I had a bunch of guys in front of me and I had a bunch of guys behind me I was kind of in the middle of the company and kept hearing these things going overhead like angry bees and everything else and I stopped and I'm looking around and I'm something's not right here I didn't see anybody in front of me I didn't see nobody behind me and all of a sudden I heard in the bushes this hey yeah it's all get down they're trying to kill you and I finally realized that well, there were bullets going over my head and there were people actually trying to kill me and that's when uh, I got down and learned how to hide real good <laughs> Well, that was, yeah, that was the first reality check uh, about being out on a mission. Uh, there was a lot of different things that, that went on because when you got to Vietnam, what they did was is they put you in, a, in like in a holding or a staging area and then they would give you what they call in-country or uh, in-country training. And that'd be uh, one week's worth of training. One was to get you climatized to the weather and the other thing is, is to get you used to what you probably going to run into out in the bush. Uh, there was four of us. We were in Ca Cameron Bay, and then they shipped us further south after we got done with our training, and we went to uh, the 9th Infantry. And we got onto our base camp, and it was kind of funny. Uh, they put us in big barracks over there waiting for us to get our, our company assigned. And all of us, all the newbies, uh, the new blood, we were... Uh, Clowning around and smoking cigarettes, laughing and, and visiting with one another, and we heard these big explosions going off, and we thought we were getting bombarded or getting rocketed, and then we all freaked out, jumped out, and we started to run out the door to hit the bunkers. One guy he misjudged and he hit the door frame, knocked himself out. We grabbed him, drug him out. When we got outside, uh, 
some of the other guys, they're all looking at us and they're all starting to laugh and pointing at us and everything else. What we didn't realize was it was the Navy ships were shooting uh, rounds out, supporting our troops that were out in the field. So that was another reality. You know, there's a lot of realities over there. But like I said, that, that first one, the one, like I said, the first time I ever went out on, in the bush was uh, when the rounds were going overhead and realizing the fun was over. This was for real. I don't know who they were out there, but they were trying to kill me. It's just something you have to get your mind set to and everything else. So. Um, I see you got a Purple Heart. Can I ask about that? <sighs> you know, uh, that first mission we went on, uh, normally what we don't, you, I didn't realize it at that time, but I finally I learned later. Uh, uh, normally you don't walk on well-used trails. And we, uh, on that first mission, we were running late because we were getting ambushed all the time from, uh, with the VC and everything. And they would delay us, so we were going to miss our rendezvous point at the time with uh, the Navy. So we called our battalion commander and we told him that we needed to put that rendezvous point back because we were running late. And he come on glute and he told us, no way. He says, you will meet the Navy at the designated time or you'll walk back to the ships. So we started humping or walking using the trails and everything else and we got ambushed uh, about maybe a mile away from where we were supposed to be picked up. And uh, one guy, one of the guys that was the last one in, in, in the company, about third or fourth guy that was supposed to, uh, last one in the, in the, in the company, and, uh, he only had about a week left. And that day was supposed to, he shouldn't have even been out in, uh, in the field. But uh, we got ambushed and we all got down there and returning fire and everything else, but I could hear them hollering for medics. And then I heard also further up, they said, get up and go. So we got up and I ran up and I finally told our sergeant, I said, there's a, a squad back there, they're pinned down there and they need a medic. So uh, I love medics, they're crazy. But uh, our medic, he worked his way back there, and, and apparently by the time he got back there, it was too late because that young man, he uh, got shot in his eye, and a bullet came out the back, and of course it killed him. And uh, the last time I was out there, uh, a similar thing happened. We were running late, and we were told that we needed to get down, uh, get to the, our rendezvous point. I had a buddy of mine, him and I, we were walking what we call rear security, and uh, we are going down the trails and we were going to take a break, they call it, take a smoke break, so him and I, we laid behind a log, he's a grenadier, uh, grenadier, he shoots, uh, I don't know if you guys ever remember, looks like a shot off shotgun, short, uh, short but it was a grenade launcher. So him and I, we were laying there behind a, a log in the trail we were traveling on, and uh, we were having a cigarette, and the VC, you rarely ever see them when you're in the jungles. They're hard, they're good. They know how to hide, they know how to fight. But anyway, uh, we were sitting there having a cigarette, and him and I were kind of watching the trail and kind of laughing, and I don't know why. Uh, this is the first time I ever saw them really screw up. Uh, we saw three, four of them come around a corner, around the bushes, and uh, they froze, and him and I, we both kind of stopped, and we froze, and we were looking at each other, and we kind of recovered before they did, and uh, we opened up on them. He hit, threw a round at him, and I shot at him. We don't know whether we hit anybody or not, but all hell broke loose after that. So my partner and I, here we are, we're the last, we're the last ones in, in the company, and we jumped into some canals so we wouldn't be so exposed. And as there was firefighting was going back and forth and everything, our sergeant, he hollered at, he says, when you hear us holler, you get up and get back to the lines with us. So the sergeant, he screamed hollered, and my partner and I, we both jumped up, and we started to go back towards our lines. And as I was walking, uh, getting my way back to the lines, I uh, put my weapon on automatic, and I turned around, and I pulled a trigger. 
in the not realizing that when we jumped to the canals, I got water and mud up the barrel of my rifle, and it blew up, and I put shrapnel in my left eye. And uh, there I was, screaming and hollering, and bullets going all over the place, screaming and hollering, I'm going to die, I'm dying, and everybody's screaming and hollering at me, he says, get your ass up, get back over here, and I said, uh -uh, I'm dying, I'm dying, and next thing I know, there's two big guys, they came running at me and grabbed me underneath my shoulders and everything and drug me back to uh, to our guys. Medics are crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I you know, I thought I was actually gonna die. And then I ended up going over uh, we ended up when uh, they finally got me the area we were in was too dense for a regular dust off chopper, but our battalion commander he came in with his small observation chopper and uh, picked me up, took me to the Navy uh, the hospital ships. So, uh, after that, you were on medical discharge? No, I, uh, I, I spent, uh, f oh, I don't know, was, I spent about four or five days in the hospital. It was kind of funny because I spent my birthday in the hospital. My, let me see, it was uh, my 19th birthday I spent in the hospital. And uh, after I got my glasses and everything, they gave me a pair of glasses, say, hey, here, this is going to help you and everything else. Uh, I got out of the hospital and made my way back to my unit. It was kind of funny because, like I say, almost a year to the date, I had my right leg get screwed up, got all infected, and they had to cut the leg open. And uh, I spent my 20th birthday in hospitals over there. And that's when I finally got my medical discharge. Because uh, when I finished my first tour, I uh, volunteered to extend my tour. I didn't want to leave Vietnam anymore. Wow. It was crazy. <laughs> uh, it, it was a lot of fun, but it was crazy. We had a lot of freedom over there. Uh, we'd do crazy stuff, go out, party, hammer down, uh, womenize. Uh, it was no state site, yes sir, no sir, spit polished boots or formations. Uh, as when we went out on missions, we went out on missions and took care of business. When we came back, we uh, resupplied, cleaned up, and, and they pretty much more or less left us alone. You know, back state site and everything else, it was KP. Uh, you'd have to salute, and you'd have to, yes sir, and you'd have to be spit polished boots, clean fatigues, and uh, none of that stuff in Vietnam. So you had a lot of freedom. You said it took a lot of healing after you came back. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, when I when I volunteered to, to uh, extend my tour. I got a 30-day leave, and that was, that was I don't know, it was kind of a really weird reality. I got a 30-day leave to come back stateside, you know, we called New World, and they wouldn't let me come back Christmas, but they let me try to get back home before New Year's. So, let me see, this was in 69. Uh, flew back to Alaska, and when I uh, landed at the airport, it was like about 20 minutes before midnight, and uh, I told a cab driver, and back in 1970, $20 was a lot of money, but I told a cab driver, I said, you can get me to Fulton Street, my home, before midnight, I said, the $20 bill is yours, and he did. And I didn't tell nobody I was coming home, and when I got home, I kicked the door open and started screaming and hollering in my ear. One of my sisters, she started screaming and hollering at me, saying, be quiet, what are you doing? Don't you know it's almost midnight? She's, she started saying, wait a minute, is that you? And I smiled and laughed, yeah. She said, wow. And I said, yeah. I said, she says, welcome home. And I said, well, I'm only home a little while. So I went uh, and I harassed my mom and my stepfather and uh, found out where a party was, where a lot of my friends, some of my ex-girlfriends were. And I, I went back over there, I went to that party, and everybody was happy to see me. And of course, at first I was happy to see them. And I got a beer and everything else. And first, 
first hour was okay, but after that I find really weird and out of place. And I finally found myself in a corner, drinking a beer all by myself, watching all my friends, thinking they're just kids, you know, they're just innocent kids that haven't seen anything or done anything that a lot of us in Vietnam we had to go through. So uh, I got restless and anxious. I didn't want to be there anymore, and I didn't want to be home anymore. I, well, to me, home was in Vietnam. Uh, it was, was uh, the guys I left. And uh, I couldn't wait to get back. So, you know, I, I spend uh, the next 29 days being miserable. But uh, uh, finally, when I, when I got back on the airplane to uh, go back to Vietnam, it was, uh, it was pretty good. <laughs> so, I, I thought I healed. <laughs> But yeah, no, it felt good to go back. Excuse me. I watch all these other uh, films. And I was like, I ain't going to cry. Here I'm crying. But yeah, no, it felt good to get back to Vietnam with uh, the guys that I served with. Because that's, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, they don't understand that when you're around, around a certain group of guys, a small group, they become like your family. And, you know, we always try to portray that we're doing the right thing. And a lot of the truth comes out later on. The only reason why we do what we do is we don't do it for our country. We don't do it for God. What we do is we do it for each other that are down there serving. So, yeah, that was a... Even now, it was a reality check on me. But yeah, it took a lot of. I, when I, when I finally got a medical discharge in 1970. I had to come back home, and, and when I get back to Fairbanks, uh, I started a real downward spiral. I was just drinking a lot, uh, doing a lot of drugs. Uh, I had got good jobs and everything else. I had a lot of different relationships, broken relationships, marriages. I've uh, got seven kids. I've been married five times, divorced five times. And uh, but I don't know. I always, I always, I don't know. I must have had a death wish or something like a lot of non-vets going out, blackout drinking, getting the car wrecks, getting a lot of fights, and then. Uh, Finally, back in 1988, uh, my fourth marriage, I got a divorce. I had a set of twins, a boy and a girl. And uh, their mom, uh, I didn't think was a very good mother, so I decided that I would go ahead and uh, fight for custody for them twins. And then in uh, 1989, I got custody of them when uh, they were 11 months old. I raised them. But, uh, the day after I got custody of them, there was an agreement that I wouldn't consume alcohol while they were in my care. So uh, being spiteful, uh, I took the kids over to my mother's house and I said, here, they're in your care for tonight. And I went to this one bar where uh, this one guy that used to chase their mother, uh, I knew he was hanging out over there. So I went, well, I went to one bar and I downed four Heinekens. And then when I went to the other bar where I was going to catch this guy and I was going to kick the living shit out of him, uh, I was drinking a beer. And I told him, I says, well, after I get my hands on you and I kick the hell out of you, you can go home and tell her that I'm still drinking. Uh, the kids ain't in my care, but I'm still drinking. She can't control me. And I said, and then you can tell her after I kick the shit out of you. And another non vet came in, uh, we call him Hook. He has a hand missing, he's got a hook there. I don't know why. I says, Hook, tell me to behave. And he says, behave your ass, Cleveland. I said, okay. So uh, I told the guy, I says, it's your lucky night tonight. I said, I'm going to finish my beer. He says, I'm going to leave. But you still can tell her I'm still out drinking. So I went home to my mom's and uh, crashed out. And the next morning when I woke up, I kind of realized 
the stupid things I did is that I put my kids as safety in jeopardy. And uh, one of the agreements was is that I had to attend uh, 90 meetings, AA meetings, within a year for custody of my children. And uh, anyway, I woke up on my mom's couch and I was looking up the ceiling and I said, oh, Jesus, here we go again, it's the booze. So for nine, no, for this 10 days, 10 days, I was crawling a wall because I know I needed to start AA, didn't want to do it. And, uh, but I needed to do it, so I was going to do it as quickly as I could, and I did. I did 90 meetings in about 42 days. But at third meeting, there was a man, he spoke, and he allowed me to understand that I'd been fighting life ever since I'd been back from Vietnam, and I finally at that time surrendered, and then I gave up back in uh, March 1988. And since then, I started a healing journey and a lot of help from a lot of different combat veterans and uh, from Native elders. That was one of the things when I was growing up, I never grew up with my tradition, my Native side, because my dad, when uh, he was growing up, that was right at early statehood, so, well, even before statehood, they would, the Christians and everything, they would take the kids away from the families and the villages and they'd send them to boarding schools. And then when they got to the schools, they were to assimilate the, all the kids into uh, the Western culture. So whenever they spoke their languages, they were punished or humiliated. And when they sing their songs, they weren't allowed to. And so my dad, he never taught us none of that. But as I started to sober up back in the 80s, there were Native elders started coming my way, and they started teaching me about Native spirituality. You know, as I'm holding my an eagle feather, it's, uh, I've been told that when you speak, you speak with an eagle feather, it'll give you the strength and, and the courage. Although there are tears, and I think, I guess, you know, it's okay to shed tears when you have to. So, you know, uh, I sobered up in 1988, and slowly but surely I started to uh, heal and become stronger and a better man. I've gotten involved here in this community, and I've gotten involved with veterans' organizations. I've gotten involved with a lot of different Native cultural uh, organizations. And I've, I've had a blessed life. I've had a lot of good elders come to my life, and they put their wing over me, and I've allowed me to grow and learn. So I've been pretty patient and, and loving. So. How did both the veterans and the elders, how did they help? Well, there's a guy here in the community, his name is John Swan. He used to work at the Veterans Center. And uh, my fourth ex, she used to go into the Veterans Center. And a lot of the guys that used to work at the Veterans Center and everything else, of course, they were trying to, she was a she, pretty big gal. She was five foot eleven. And uh, she was a good-looking gal, and they'd always try to help her and everything else and hope maybe getting a date with her or be able to take her out. And then she would tell me what all these guys at the Veterans Center were doing to help her. This is prior to our divorce. Uh, they would try to help her to screw me over. And finally, it, it got me pissed off where I finally called up. I found out John Swan was in charge of the Veterans Center. And... Uh, I finally called up and I, I says, is John Swan there? And he says, well, yeah, hold on a minute. So you know, it was about two, three minutes. The guy comes on. I said, hello. I said, hey, this is John Swan? He says, yeah. I says, uh, I says I'm Benno Cleveland. And he said, who? I says, I'm Benno Cleveland, Teresa Cleveland's uh, husband. I says, and she's telling me about all these things you guys are down there trying to do to help her screw me over. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I'm, I'm the veteran. She's not. And I said, you know, that should be my safe haven down there, not hers. I said, but, you know, you want to screw me over, there's no problem. I says, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to kill you. And he says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What are you talking about? And I said, you heard me. I said, I'm coming down and I'm going to kill you. I don't need your bullshit. So he said, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, uh, give me about 20 minutes. And I said, I'll go talk with my guys. 
And he hung up, and I told him, I said, you got 20 minutes. So He called back, oh, I don't know, it must have been about 18 minutes, 15 minutes, he called back. And he says, you know, he says, when you were talking to me, telling me what was going on, I understood what you were saying. So I told all my guys she's not to come into the Veterans Center. And uh, you are right, this is your home, not hers. So she's not allowed to come here no more. And we're not, he says, but what my guys do after work, I can't guarantee. I says, I ain't worried about after, okay. The Veterans Center, if I need to, that should be my place, not hers. So he says, fine. I don't know, she had the right way of pushing my buttons. And uh, she pushed my buttons to where I went into a blackout or a flashback. And uh, that one day I, I realized what was going on. I was at my mom's house again with the kids and I started pacing the floor back and forth just like we used to do when I used to be in Vietnam before a mission. A lot of us would pace and psych ourselves out and uh, get ready for a mission. And I started feeling myself doing that. I started pacing back and forth, realizing I was getting ready to go out on a mission. Realizing I was getting myself ready to go out and kill again. And uh, I called John Swan. He brought me into the Veterans Center. And, uh, he worked with me, and I thought it was maybe only a half hour. But he told me he worked out, he worked on me for three hours to try to bring me back to reality. And ever since then, uh, he's been a, a tremendous help, and he became a tremendous friend and brother. And him and I, we've done a lot of things in, uh, gosh, I don't know how long, 24 years now, we've done a lot of things together. Uh, he's just, he's helped me a lot, and then he's gotten involved with uh, what we call gatherings, traditional gatherings we used to do up here. Uh, we did what we call a living history over at Lathrop High School, and then throughout the North Star Borough, we went to schools and teach them, uh, you know, talk to kids about combat in Vietnam. Uh, we've grown real close, and we've helped one another. That's how uh, he's helped me heal, a combat veteran. And of course, getting in contact with other veterans, uh, trying to help them helps me as well. Uh, the elders, they've just taught me how to be of service to the people. And that was something that was lacking in my, my, my life. Is, uh, I didn't care about anything or anybody until they came along and started teaching me about how to pray and how to care. And that's how I started my healing. It's kind of like AA. I don't know if you've ever been to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting because that's helped me quite a bit as well. You know, there's an Indian saying that says the most beautiful quality of true friendship is to understand and be understood. And a lot of people don't understand AA or NA or any of them 12 steps. When uh, you try to quit drinking or drugs, uh, the members of that fellowship, they understand because they've been there. They understand, they have patience, and then they share with you so you can understand and then try to help yourself. Then the elders, like I said, they just came along. They taught me how to pray and to be of service uh, to the people of the community. And I, what I found out is uh, you have to learn how to be true and strong for yourself, and then you be true and strong for your family, then for the community. And when you're true and strong in these three ways, or is it, yeah, when you're true and strong in these three ways, then you're true and strong for your Creator. So that's how the elders helped me. Do you still feel like you're on the journey of healing? All the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I didn't expect... Uh, all them tears to come uh, and uh, those emotions to come out. You know, it's kind of funny. You think you're getting old, you're tough, you've gone through it all and everything else, and here you are sitting in front of a camera and tears are coming out. So, yeah, there's still healing in there to be left. There's still growth, still a lot to learn yet. I truly believe that. You know, if I don't learn until the day I die, I'm going to get in trouble. And I think I've done enough of that already. So. 
Mm. You said at the beginning that you don't regret going into the army at all. No, you know, there's there there's been a lot of hardships. There's been a lot of pain, lost some good friends. Uh, I have a lot of medical problems right now. Uh, matter of fact, my left eye's got to be the laser, you know, uh, cataracts got to be redone, and then right eye's got to be have a cataract removed. Uh, I've got Agent Orange problems. Uh, I've been diagnosed with a bad heart, bad blood circulation. I have uh, an enlarged prostate. I've got a bad digestive system, but I don't regret none of it. A lot of people don't understand. Uh, that when I, went, when I went to Vietnam, nobody had to take my place. Nobody had to die for me. You know, that's one of the things about uh, the protesters, those, those that ran away to Canada, ran away over to Europe, or used the college to get out of serving. Uh, they don't realize that when they ran away, somebody else had to take their place. Right? A lot of them guys that ended up getting drafted because those that ran away, a lot of them, well, all of them were either brothers or, or sons. Some were fathers and husbands, and some of them people got killed. Some of them guys got killed because somebody ran away. So that's one of the things I, I don't regret because I went into the military and I went to Vietnam. Nobody had to take my place. Not only that, you... Uh, the veterans, which is a crazy bunch of guys anyhow, combat veterans. Uh, I don't think I'd change the camaraderie that I have uh, with any of the veterans, the, the friendships that I've developed with some of these crazy guys. I don't know. It's a, it's a strong bond that we have with one another. Do you find that that bond kind of goes across conflicts, or is it this bond stronger with other Vietnam veterans? No, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm with a lot of different vet, uh, veterans organizations, uh, but the two that I'm really active with is the Alaska Native Veterans Association and the Military Order of Purple Hearts. And right now I serve as the president with the Alaska Native Veterans, and I'm also commander for the Military Order of Purple Hearts. And we have uh, young soldiers that are members of the MOPH, the Military Order of Purple Hearts. And uh, there's a 40-year span, but we still have a bond because, you know, we know what they've gone through. And uh, we can be there for them. We can be there to harass them and joke with them and tease them and, and try to make them understand that we care and we respect them. You know, unlike with Vietnam, Vietnam, when we came back home and everything else, and nobody wanted us. You know, they uh, started fights with us, they spit on us, they threw shit at us, called us baby killers, women killers, you know. And uh, I think that's one of the things about Vietnam veterans when we finally snapped out of that deep sleep and anger and hatred we were in, uh, a lot of us, we stood up to try to make a difference for our soldiers today, vowing that we would not let what happened to us happen to them. So, because them guys that put on a uniform, the guys and gals, because the women in there too, uh, when they put on that uniform, and they stand up for what we're supposed to stand for and for our rights and our freedoms, uh, you have to respect them. You have to admire them because they're willing to give, like I said, they're willing to give their lives for, for us, for their people, for each other. Do you see that it, just like it took you a little while to kind of come back to reality at home, do you see that same kind of transition period for some of these younger veterans of maybe the Iraq and Afghanistan wars? I think some of them are going to have a hard time. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, you have to really admire these guys. They're going over there for four, five, maybe six tours. 
You know, so it, it's definitely going to have a heart. I mean, a, a big impact on, on the way they think and feel their lives. Some of them, they'll be okay. And it's just like Vietnam. A lot of the veterans that came back from Vietnam, a good part of them, they didn't have too many problems. I had to, I had to laugh. One year we had a, a form at Alaska Land. Well, they call it Pioneer Park. I'm old. I'm old Fairbanks boy. It's Alaska Land. But uh, it's like Mike Schultz. I don't know if you ever heard of Mike Schultz. He's our weatherman on one of the TV networks. Some of the other veterans, they were all talking. They were all talking about how uh, a good experience the military was and how much fun they had and they don't have no problems and everything else. And then when I started to speak to people that were there and listen to the forum, I told them that I was completely different. I told them exactly how I ended up getting into the military and then how my life sucked. For 18 years, I was in hell and misery. And <laughs> I got a, another partner, he's a Marine veteran. Uh, Dana Knocktree. Uh He was out there with a bunch of the other Marines. I'm not Marine, I'm Army. But uh, he's out there watching all this going on. He says, when you started talking and talking about the misery and the hell and, and all the gory stuff, he says, you should have seen them other veterans just look at you with horrified looks. <laughs> I just had to laugh. And like I said, that, that's the kind of bonds that we build with one another. There's a lot of us that we do and we do have a hard time. A lot of us we drink real hard and stuff, and we go into blackout. Sometimes we get mean. Sometimes we don't. But other veterans, they come back and they don't have such a bad time. Depending on, I guess, what's bothering them or, what, or where they've been and what they've done, because you got a lot of a lot of soldiers, a lot of troops. They go over there. They're not combat. They're support uh, units. They don't have to go see a lot of the stuff, the uh, infantry and the fighting troops see. It's kind of hard. It messes your head up for a while. It stays with you for forever, though. So that's what I'm talking about. You know, I don't think I would trade trade the bond that I have with a lot of these other veterans. Uh, we're all too crazy. You know, we love one another. So that's something that uh, those guys that ran away, they'll never understand. And uh, God bless them, crazy vets. <laughs> what advice would you give young people thinking about joining the military? I, uh, the advice I would give them, I'd tell them to pray on it and think on it very seriously. Uh, I don't know, you know, right now I think we might be winding down in Afghanistan and Iraq. But, you know, when we, John Swan and I, when we first started uh, Living History, we went for probably around 18 years, we went into the high schools. Latham High School used to be fun because that's where I went to high school. And we'd tell them kids, we'd tell them, look, you're not old enough. But there's going to come a day where there's going to be a conflict, a war, where it might affect you just like it did us because we never thought when we were teenagers that we'd never see Vietnam. So that's one of the things I would, I would advise them is, is to think and pray on it pretty hard because it could be a, a, a life-changing experience. To some of the other ones that are, are, are wanting to join and everything else, yeah. I would tell them that, you know, look real hard into what kind of a career you would like to have and get that training through the military if you don't have school for a higher education. Because the military offers a wonderful education. You said to people think long and hard, and I, I you know, you're talk, talking about talking to these young people, and I think back to, you said when you came back, and people your own age, you know, they were they were different from you. I mean, are you in in some way? Are you trying to spare these young people that you know? Make sure you're you're ready for this. I just want to let them know that you know, 
joining the military can be can be a lot of fun, but it it can be real altering life changes. I don't know, you know, as, like I say, I, I went through what I had to go through. Uh, I don't regret it. You know, I've hurt a lot of people. Uh, I don't know what kind of effects I had even on my own children. I know the women that were in my life, uh, I know I've hurt them quite a bit. Uh, it just takes a toll on, 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 a, on the spirit, on the soul. But, uh, you know, after climbing out of that darkness and everything else and changing, uh, to me it's made it worthwhile because all them experiences has made me who I am today. And the thing is, is I just want to let the, the young young people know that it's a serious decision they need to make. The ones that want to get, like I said, as I said before, a lot of people sometimes, especially some of my native friends, they have a hard time when I, I tell our our native uh, youth that, you know, if you want to get a good education, you want to get a college education, and everything else, maybe look towards the military. They have an opportunity where you can go in there and get good education, you can get a good career, you get paid while you're doing it, you get medical and the whole ball of wax. But I hope they understand uh, that if there is a war that's going on or there's going to be a conflict while they're, on, while they're in there serving, they'll be called on. And a lot of them might have to answer the same call that we did. They'll have to go into combat. And, uh, Combat is definitely not easy. Uh, screws you up for quite a while. Is there anything else you want people to know? No, it's just uh, if there is any 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 Vietnam veterans still out there. I mean, cause there's a lot of veterans still out there. I mean, I'm 62. And there's guys out there probably even in their 70s right now they're still screwed up. You know, maybe once in a while if they're having a hard time and everything else or to the family members, you know, just smile at them and don't give up on them. Pray for them. Show them kindness and let them know that you love them once in a while and hope for the best for them. And uh, the other thing is, is don't take our soldiers for granted. Show them that you appreciate and respect them. That's the biggest thing, is to let our, our troops know that we love and respect them and care for them. Good words to end on. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Veteran. Thank you for your service. Well, thank you.